Then you have the southern kingdom, two tribes in Judah. And God would, God would use the smallest out of all to fulfill his promise to give us the Messiah. But we have a divided kingdom now. But God promised, as we read in the book of Micah, remember that's in Spanish. That's a little bit of Spanish I threw in there for you. Micaeus. Can you say that? Micaeus. There you go. I give everybody an A+. Plus. Oh, you got an F, brother. And he said, I will surely gather O Jacob. So we talked about that. That's the promise that he's making. It's a divided kingdom, but God says, I'm not done yet. And we read it in the King James, and we'll tell you why again. And we'll just give you a recap. He says, I will surely gather, surely assemble O Jacob. He's talking about the 12 tribes, his 12 children. All of thee I will surely gather. Then he says, who? The remnant of Israel. So when we look at history and we study the, the Jewish history, we'll notice, we'll notice that the two kingdoms, the north and the south, they were known by names. The north was known by Israel. That was the name, Israel. So the scripture here is talking to who? The remnant of the northern kingdom. You see, when you read, when you read the, the word of God, every single thing, this, this comma, this comma, all these commas here, they're there for a purpose. Everything that God has given us through the inspired word is there for a purpose. And he says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, the 12 tribes. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. So he's speaking to who? He's speaking to the northern kingdom. He's telling them, I'm going to gather you, but where? He said, I will surely gather you, and I will put them together as the sheep of Botswara. And we use the King James Bible in this version here, what we're talking about here, we use the King James for the reason that it uses the word Basra, which means a, in, in, in our English language, fortified wall. So if we were to read it in the ESV translation, it would just say, I will gather you like sheep into the fold. And that's fine. We understand what he's trying to say. But we're going to the King James, and the King James is saying not just a fold, but he's describing what it is. He said, I'm going to gather the northern kingdom into a fortified wall. Now, today, as we mentioned, a lot of people will tell you that there's a lot of debate, there's scholarly debate today whether the 10 tribes of Israel survived what we're going to talk about. Some people think they disappeared and others, but I'm of the mindset that I don't believe they disappeared because I believe that this scripture here is fulfilled and archaeology proves it today. What happens when a, when a house is divided? Is there love? No. There's sadness. There's depression. Uh, the, the scripture says every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. Now, the Bible is against a house divided because it leads to a lack of what? Unity, which ultimately will lead to destruction. When a family or a community or a nation is divided, it is, a, it is unable to function effectively. And what happens? It becomes more vulnerable to external threats because they're divided. The Bible teaches that unity is essential for the health and the well-being of a family and a community. It encourages believers to work together, to love one another, that's what we talked about, and to put the needs, uh-oh, here it is, of others before our own. Very important. When a community is united, it's better able to accomplish its goal and fulfill its purpose. Now, Mark, the gospel Mark tells us, if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. So we have Israel now in our history. We're talking about Israel, and Israel is divided into two kingdoms. What does that tell us? That they were vulnerable for attacks. They were not united. And why? Because of what we read earlier, because of their sin when they said, give us a king like everybody else. These were the consequences. 
You know, sometimes our decisions right now with our children will affect their children in the future. It's very important. How did this happen? Now I want to introduce you to the Assyrian army. This is part of what has been found in different areas. I want to describe to you the Assyrian army. The Assyrian army was a ruthful, ruthless army. They skinned people alive. They were, uh, for their time, very well in technology. Uh, they knew how to attack cities. They knew how to destroy fortified walls. And we'll, I'll show you what a fortified wall is in those times. The Assyrian army emerged in the 25th century before Christ. And that is what is known today as present-day Iraq. So they came from what is known today as present-day Iraq. That's where they came from, the Assyrians. And they played a significant role in the expansion of the empire, which reached its height in the 7th century. The Assyrian army was known, and I want you to hear this, for its advanced military tactics and technology, including chariots, engines, and iron weapons. They, they, were, they were what you would call a premier like the United States. I had an uncle who was, he, he's passed away already, but he was a Korean War veteran, classified Q. And I remember uh, two weeks before he passed, I sat down and I interviewed him, and he said, I will tell you something about our country. He said, we have enough firepower to destroy the whole world, the United States Army. He said, this is why we're so feared by everybody. That was a description of what the Assyrians were. They were the premier army in that time period. What is a fortified city? You ever seen these before? These were used and they were very important. You would have a man stand up here and he'd be a watchtower. He'd be watching, making sure that the, the, the city was protected. Now, these fortified walls were, were huge. Sometimes they, they stretch one mile wide. You can just ride right on top of them. And the reason that they were built was to protect all of those within the city from attacks. So you had to be a very strong army to destroy a fortified wall. You literally had to be very strong. And if you remember the scripture, as we go back to the scripture here, Remember that the prophecy here is telling us that God had promised that he would gather the 12 tribes together in a fortified wall. So as you begin to understand what's going on here, you're going to begin to develop in your mind and say, okay, well, now I know what's going to happen here. And archaeology today has proven to us what we're going to talk about here. Now, the Assyrian army, we have a fortified wall here. It was made for what? For protection. It was made to control the residents, control access to the city, within the city, to monitor those that were entering, those that were leaving the city. It was a symbol, a fortified wall served as a symbol of strength and power. The, more, the bigger the wall, the stronger the city was protected. Now, the prophet Isaiah had written about the Assyrian army. If you were to go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, and I've given it here in the scripture in the NLT so we can understand it a little bit better. Listen to what Isaiah wrote. Being inspired by God, he said, What sorrow awaits Assyria? The rod of my anger. This is the Lord speaking. He said, Imagine God speaking. He said, What sorrow awaits them? But listen to what he says. I use it as a club to express my anger. You know, sometimes we, we, we see things happening in the world and we say, well, why is God permitting this? Sometimes God permits things to happen because he's using it for his purpose. He can use the sinner to fulfill his will. That's who God is. You know, and Isaiah is saying here that the Lord is saying, I'm going to use them for what? To express my anger. Why? I'm sending Assyria against, listen to how much Israel had departed from God. I'm sending them to who? A godless nation. Sad. And then he says, against a people with whom I am angry. This is God speaking. This is God's judgment. He's pronouncing his judgment is soon coming 
to those. And he says, Assyria will plunder them. And this is what the Assyrians did. They didn't just kill people. They were violent. They not just burned people. They, they literally plundered people, killed them to death. Children, women, babies, everything. The Assyrians will plunder them, trampling them like dirt beneath its feet. But the king of Assyria will not understand that he is my tool. <laughs> Listen to what God is saying. He's not going to understand that he is my tool. Then it says, his mind does not work that way. His plan is simply to destroy, to cut down nation after nation. So the Assyrians thought, oh boy, we are the best army in the world. They're destroying nation after nation after nation, and they thought it was because they had their own power. Don't it sound like some of the presidents today that we have around the world, some of these dictators that they think they got it all made? They're there because God has permitted them to be there. But if God wanted, he'll take them out right away. He'll send somebody and take them out. But this shows you how much Israel, not only had they divided as a nation, but they also had become a godless nation. Imagine. The people that had taken a covenant with God and God pronounces and he says, they're a godless nation. In other words, they don't want nothing to do with me. But you know what? God said, I will punish them. Was it because he hated Israel? No. He was going to discipline them so that they would turn back to him. He was going to do this because he loved them, because of the promise. He had made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. What was the promise that he had made Jacob? We read again that he would gather them in a fortified city. But now when we read what Isaiah is saying, it may seem as if that's not going to be fulfilled. How is he going to gather them if he's bringing judgment on the divided nation of Israel? Here begins the attack. So we have the Assyrian army. And they're gathered in their area, and the invasion of the whole area begins. You go back and you read history. In all these places here, we have found a lot of archaeological facts that have been fulfilled. Assyria begins to attack the first city. Arm Damascus is the first city they attack. The invasion of the Assyrian army had a significant impact on all this region. It marked the beginning of the end for the Armenian kingdom of Damascus, which was absorbed into the Assyrian Empire. So they came and they attacked them. It also led to the destruction of what we're going to talk about next. So the Assyrians begin. God allows them to begin to bring judgment on the nations and especially on his people. So they begin the first attack. It is said that they wiped out Damascus, killed everybody every single child and baby everything they were uh they had no mercy on nobody but guess this is damascus here this was the capital guess who was right next to them the northern kingdom uh oh so now they attacked damascus and what did the king of assyria say the next kingdom is Israel. I'm going to destroy Israel. The Assyrians attacked now the northern kingdom. Remember, the nation is divided. So up here we have the northern kingdom, and down here we have Judah. But the promise was that he would gather them. But right now, it don't seem like he's going to gather anybody. Right now, it seems like they're going to be scattered everywhere. The Assyrian army attacks the northern kingdom of Israel in a series of campaigns that took them several years to fulfill. What were some of the tactics? Warfare, military technology, and number three, psychological warfare. They use psychology to intimidate their enemies. They were known for their brutality and their willingness to use terror and violence to subjugate their enemies, and they would often impale or behead their prisoners and display their heads on poles to strike fear into the hearts of their enemies. Oh, that sounds terrible. Terrible. Now, they attack 
Israel in the north. And guess what happens? Israel is wiped out. Now, this is where scholars today will say, that's it. The ten tribes have disappeared, and we don't know where they went. We don't know what has happened to them. And Judah, the, the southern side is left. And then we know the history, and they say, well, we don't know what's happened to them. But remember what we talked about. God had a, a, a promise for his people. Do you believe when God promises something, he'll fulfill it? Amen. Amen. And you read this today, and, and I was talking to Brother uh, Snyder about this earlier today. When it comes, for example, to, to the message of the church, sometimes it's difficult for us or individuals to understand the message if we don't understand the difference between the kingdom of God and the church. That's the key to this. And man, we, we can go into history right now, but we're going to focus on this right now. But it's so important to understand that first. And we see here that the northern kingdom is invaded and attacked completely. Now, let's turn to archaeology. Here's the question. Is there anything in the Bible that shows us the 12 tribes of Israel were ever reunited after being divided? That's the question that we would ask ourselves. Is there anything in the Bible that will lead us to believe that there was a reunification of the nation of Israel? Now, we read Micah. Could we say that that is a scripture that tells us? Yeah. What did Micah say? God had promised in Micah, I will surely assemble again, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together as the sheep of Bosra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. So I don't know about you, but when I read the scriptures in the Bible, um, I always see like these words jumping at me. So first I see on here, surely assemble. So I know that something's going to happen. He's going to assemble. Then who's he speaking to? He's speaking to Jacob. So then I think, okay, who's Jacob? Oh, the 12 tribes. So he's saying, I'm going to gather the 12 tribes. So then I break it down and he says, I'm going to gather from those 12 tribes a remnant. So if he's talking about a remnant, then something has to take place for there to be a remnant from the full number of the tribes. And then we're looking at the Assyrian attacks and we're saying, okay, then there's something going on here. Then he says, I'll, I'll gather them. I'll put them into a sheep like in Bazar. You see right here, this is the sheep. They're being gathered into this fortified wall. It doesn't look too comfortable for the sheep in there. But they feel safe within the walls. You know, I told somebody, he said, I, you know, I just want to make it to heaven. I don't care if they have to just kick me into heaven and push me over it, but I made it. As, as long as I make it into heaven. And these sheep here are gathered in there but they feel safe, even though they're all bunched up. Then it says that as they are gathered, they're going to make great noise. So I'm thinking, okay, there's got to be something within this. The idea that the ten tribes were lost, like I said, is a topic of debate, but some people believe that the ten tribes were lost as a result of the Assyrian conquest. So when they came, you saw they destroyed Damascus, and then they came to the northern, and you think, oh, well, they were all lost. And this happened in the year 722 before Christ. Now, I want you to notice something. Um, today, when you're learning history in school, it's so sad. We are accustomed to A.D. after death and B.C. before Christ. Now they've changed B.C. to B.C.E. And it stands for before the common era. I don't like to use that. I like to use before Christ because that's what it's supposed to be about is Christ. Even in history, they're trying to remove some of this stuff. This is <laughs> incredible. But according to this theory, the Assyrians exiled the Israelites, their homeland, and they scattered them among the nations, and it caused that the, the 10 tribes would be lost to history. Now, there are several reasons that some people believe that the 10 tribes were lost. One reason is the lack of historical records and documentation. So when we look at the, the 10 tribes, it's, we, we don't have a lot of documentation about them, about the fate of the Israelites after the Assyrians came and attacked them. Little evidence suggests that they ever returned to their homeland to reestablish the northern kingdom. But that wasn't God's purpose. He never desired 
for Israel to remain divided. It's the same thing today. God don't desire for all of his children to be scattered in all these different churches. <laughs> his desire is for all his children to be made into one. That's his desire. So in the year 1969, we have now archaeological evidence by the man by the name of Nachman Afgat, who began excavating what is known as the western hill of the city of Jerusalem. I'm going to explain to you what this is. Now, this archaeologist here, his primary work was known for his excavation and restoration of Jewish of the Jewish quarters of the old city of Jerusalem, so the old city of David. And he began his project in the 1960s and worked on it for more than two decades. He uncovered important artifacts and structures from the second temple. But in, in addition to his work, I want you to notice that in the ancient city of Beersheba and the Masada fortress, he discovered something that proves to us what the Bible says would take place. Remember, let's go back here. The promise that was made to Israel. So if we have a promise here, we have to also have evidence of that promise being fulfilled. So now we go to this archaeologist. This was the, this was Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, before the attack of the north by the Assyrian army. So remember in the map that we had earlier, to give you a better perspective here. We have the northern kingdom here, and then we have Judah. And Jerusalem is located in the southern kingdom. Jerusalem, the, the city of David. And when the Assyrians come and they attack the northern side, it, they destroy everything. They, they go city by city and then they get to Samaria, which is the capital, and they destroy it completely. While they're being destroyed, this is what the southern kingdom looked like. You have the temple, you have Jerusalem, and this was the wall that covered Jerusalem at that time. And this is what, for many years, archaeologists thought, this is what the southern kingdom looked like. Some estimated that the population of Jerusalem during this time of the northern Israel was, was very small, as you can see here. But according to the biblical account, Jerusalem was initially a small Jebusite city that was conquered by King David in the 10th century, and made into the capital of the United Kingdom of Israel. So remember, when, when they were all together, when this whole nation was together, the capital was always Jerusalem. That was the capital of the city. That was uh, when the kingdom was united in one. And it was very small during that time, and the city continued to grow and develop. And King Solomon, and then they, they, you know, they created the temple, um, and this is what it looked like during the attack of the Assyrians. But listen to what happened after the north is destroyed. Look at Jerusalem now. Can you see a difference? Do you see a difference there? Archaeologists discovered that the occupation of the Western Wall began, listen to this, at the time of the Assyrian conquest. So the same time that the Assyrians are destroying the northern kingdom, something is taking place in the south. From Zion, which is the biblical name for Jerusalem also, from Zion they are beginning to build a fortified wall. I get chills just thinking about it. So the, everything else is in, in destruction, all outside of them, and the king of Zion or the king of the south says, we, we got to build a wall. Now, I, I know you heard that before about a few years ago. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with that. Well, what's the purpose? To protect from invasions. To protect the people. So you have the south, the, 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 the southern kingdom of Jerusalem. This is how it looks. While the north is being attacked, 
But something happens. God begins to stir the heart of the king, and Jerusalem ends up being like this. And the archaeologists began to see, and listen to what it says. The archaeologists discovered that the occupation of the Western Wall began at the time of the Assyrian conquest. They found all these makeshift houses that had been built hastily and crowded together like what a refugee camp would look like. Uh-oh. Remember this? Remember this scripture here? Remember the promise? What did he say? I will surely assemble the 12 tribes. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together in what a fortified wall as the flock in the midst. And they're going to make great noise because of a multitude of people that have been gathered. And what does it say? That the archaeologists began to say, what in the world are all these houses? These houses here are so organized. Why, why does this look like a refugee camp? Something had to take place that they had to build them real quick in order to gather in the people into Zion. Listen to it. It looked like this. It looked like this. It was full of people. Where did this remnant come from? Where did they come from? From the destruction of the north. And what did they say? Let us turn our heads to Zion and let us go and find protection in Zion. And the king of Israel begins to gather all the people of Zion. And, and then uh, uh, Avi God's excavation, he begins to find out. And he said, what in the world is this? And he said, this is Hezekiah's wall. And the king at that time was Hezekiah. And Hezekiah said, we have to build this wall and gather in. The remnant, our family, is coming back together. And all those of the north, the remnant that were left, the children, the babies, the mothers, the fathers that were running away from the Assyrians, say, we ain't got nowhere else to go but to Zion. And they run to Zion and they come in. And then Hezekiah says, let's build a wall. And then what happens? The scripture becomes fulfilled. He begins to gather again. Now we have... Now we have here, we have the 10 and the 2, and we make 12, and we have the 12 tribes together again, united. God's promise fulfilled. Yes, God used the destruction all around. And you know, that's what's happening today in Christianity. We're, we're seeing all of this take place all around us. And sometimes we think that all this false teaching, God is allowing all that because out of all this, Zion has to shine. And gather them in. And listen to it. Hezekiah builds the wall. And archaeologists in 1970 uncover this wall. Hezekiah's wall is an ancient defense. Listen to this. Defense structure that surrounds the old city of Jerusalem. Defense against who? The Assyrians. It was built during the reign of King Hezekiah in the late 8th century before Christ. It's considered to be one of the most impressive and well-preserved examples of the ancient fortification in the world. It's considered to be one of the best fortified walls. It's still standing today. You know why? Because God was behind the building of that wall. Because he promised that he would gather them in Basra in the fortified wall. And if God is behind the, the project, Ain't nobody going to stop God, <laughs> you know, and he built it. It is of historical significance. Why? Because Hezekiah's wall is an important historical site that provides insight into the political and military history of ancient Israel. The wall was built during the time of political instability and external threats, the Assyrian army. They have dated this wall back exactly to the point when Assyria is coming to attack Jerusalem, Zion. And they build a wall. God begins to help them. And they gather in the people. It's of architecture significance and cultural significance. Why? Because Hezekiah's wall is an important cultural site that reflects the religious and the significance of Jerusalem. 
The wall is mentioned in the Bible as a symbol of God's protection, as a testament to the faith and courage of the people of Jerusalem. This is Hezekiah's wall today. If you were to go to Jerusalem, it's still there. Now, you'll see it here, you're like, well, well brother, why doesn't it look big? Because remember, throughout history, they're rebuilding, they're building on top and stuff, because they didn't have nowhere to dump all the stuff. This is why they're uncovering. If they were to uh, uncover this, it would go even more deeper down. And this is Hezekiah's wall. And again, it proves to us what was written in the Bible is true. Amen. Because the Bible spoke of Hezekiah's wall, and it's here. So if it spoke about that, then it's going to tell us something even greater. So now we see the prophecies fulfilled. God gathers his people in, but the army is still outside. You're talking about, um, it's like if it was 50 people against 100,000, it'd be impossible for 50 people to win a war against 100,000 people. But when God is in it, Nothing can stop it. Amen. When God is in it, and, and you know what? I'll tell you something. I am a firm believer that if God has promised something, he will fulfill it. I believe it. I've seen it done over and over and over in my life. You know, we were in a situation years ago when I was pastoring and um, we didn't have enough for the rent. And then we were moving states. I didn't know what to do. But you know what? I, I told my wife, you know, God is in control. And during that week, I went to go help a brother from the local church who needed help uh, buying a, a mobile home. And we went, and he said, the owner's coming. And this old little man comes out of his car, and he walks up to us, and he talks to us, and he had kind of like a German accent. And we just talked. We didn't talk about the Bible or nothing, but we ended up with prayer. But something about that prayer impacted this man's life. And that Wednesday, when I was in church, he calls me and he said, Pastor, he said, I want you to know who I am. He said, I'm an ex-Nazi soldier. I'm German. He said, I was forced as a young man when the Nazis came to my town to join the army. If not, they would kill mama and my sisters. He said, but I never killed anybody in the whole war. And this is why they let me to live here in the U.S. And he goes, and I have felt from God to tell you that I need to give you. And he said the exact amount that I needed to pay the rent. <laughs> and I said, what? And after that, when we left the state, he continued to correspond with us until he passed away. And I tell somebody, I said, it's amazing how, I, I tell people, I said, an ex-Nazi God used to help me. And you think about it and you laugh, but that's the God we serve. So if God promised that he would do it for Israel, and that promise is for us today, then God is going to fulfill his word. And nothing can get in the way of God's program. Nothing. Right now, we may see, we say, well, something's, no, nothing can get in the way. God in his time will take care of it. Now, the remnant is gathered in the south, remember? This was Jerusalem. Now, they've gathered all of them there, but they haven't got rid of the Assyrians. The Assyrians are still out there. They're ruthless, they're terrible, and they have over 100,000 soldiers. And what does Israel have? They're small but they have God on their side. And we're going to see here that not only does this prove to us, not, does it, not only does archaeology prove to us that this story is true, but it also proves to us that God did something supernatural in Israel. Something supernatural. We have here what we talked about yesterday, the historical record of King Sennacherib, who is the Assyrian, uh, and this is a cylinder that was found in his palace. Remember, we talked about these cylinders, and he was real good at archiving. So remember, I said this was his Facebook. He loved, he loved to show off. He would archive everything. He said, I went to this town, and I killed every single person there, and I'm the best of the world. You know, just like um, Nebuchadnezzar. That's how you pronounce his name, right? 
Well, yep. you know who I'm talking about. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. My son would play that video over and over in VeggieTales when he was little. And it just, Queen Esther also, the whole, this is the thing that comes to my mind every time I think about it. But what I'm trying to say is that these men, these kings, these pagan kings really thought really high of themselves. They really did. And they would write everything down. And archaeologists found this cylinder. And guess what showed up in this historical chronicle? The name of Hezekiah. And they get the cylinder. Archaeologists get it and they read it. And it says, listen to what it says. Regarding Hezekiah. So remember, Hezekiah is the king of where? Of the southern kingdom of Judah. Regarding Hezekiah, the Judean king. So even the Assyrians are confirming to us the truth of the scriptures. What does it say? He did not submit to my yoke. Uh-oh. He got mad. He said, he said, look, man, we killed, we, we destroyed the north. The remnant is gathered in Zion. I'm about to destroy them, but they don't want to submit to my yoke. And then what does it say? I besiege his strong cities. So as we go back here, let me go back here to give you a better understanding. We have Judah here. We have the capital of Jerusalem, and there's all these cities. And he went, Assyria went, and they destroyed all these cities. Guess which one was the only one standing? Jerusalem. The whole city of Jerusalem is standing there. You have all the 12 children of Jacob. The 12 tribes have gathered in Jerusalem, and they're shaking because the army of Assyria is coming. They've destroyed everything around us, and they're sh they, they don't know what to do. And what does the, 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 the king of, um, of Assyria say? Hey, he said, Hezekiah, the king of Judah, he didn't submit. So what did I do? I went and I destroyed his cities, his wall fortress, his countless small villages, and I conquered all of them. And now the only one to conquer was Jerusalem. The Bible record tells us now. So this is the historical, archaeological record of what we have. Now let's go to what the Bible says about this same event. In Isaiah 36 and 1, it says, it agrees with what the record of king of Assyria said. Why does it agree? Listen to what it says. In the 14th year of, the king, Hez of king Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the fortified cities of Judah, and he did what? He took them. So that agrees with what is historically written in the chronicles of Assyria. Oh, well, the Bible ain't real. All that is made up. It's mythology. It, it, it's, it's, it's fake. If it was fake, then why did these historical accounts that we today and many scholars today accept as accurate? If we accept this as accurate, then we have to accept that the Bible is accurate in everything that it says. Isaiah 1 and 8 describe the condition of Jerusalem, also known as Zion, and the daughter of Zion. Listen to what it says. It's describing the condition of Jerusalem, and it calls Jerusalem Zion. It says the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard. Listen, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. I love the way the King James uh, describes this. It gives you a better picture of the condition of Jerusalem. They're coming to attack. Everything around them is under destruction. All the cities around Jerusalem have been destroyed completely. There's a smell of death, a fire, a fear has taken over Israel. All of Judah. But in Zion, the promise of God is fulfilled. Again, let us emphasize Micah chapter 2, verse 12. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. This is God speaking. This is God's promise. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, the northern kingdom, and I will put them in, I will put them together as the sheep of 
Basra, within the walls of Zion. So you can imagine these sheep there, they're all gathered, they're bunched up, just like the archaeologists when they found these makeshift houses, they were all bunched up together. They were built rather quickly because they had to have shelter rather quickly. And then what does it say? As the flock in the midst of their fold, they shall make great noise. Can you imagine the noise that was going on? You have a, such a small city, and all of a sudden you have millions of people show up. They didn't know what to do. And Hezekiah said, we have to build a surrounding. But listen to what Isaiah, well, before we get to Isaiah, we're going to read about this. The Bible tells us about the salvation of Zion. So remember, he promised to gather them, but the Assyrians are still there. But listen to what the Bible says. Then Hezekiah, the king, and Isaiah the prophet, they got together. The son of Amos, listen to what they did. They prayed because of this, and they cried to heaven, God, help us. They didn't have nowhere to go. Everything around them outside was destroyed completely. All the cities were destroyed, and the only city that was standing was Zion. And they're praying. They didn't know who to turn to. What happened here? What happened to, oh, give us a king like everybody else? Oh, let us be a, a rule just like everybody else. No, what happened here? God sees the fulfillment of his word because the people now turn to God. Not just two tribes, all the tribe, all 12 of them turn to God. And the Bible says that they cry out to heaven. Could you imagine the desperation in them? the fear that was upon them, the little children knowing what was going to happen, they're going to die. They were completely going to die. You're talking about 185,000 soldiers, the Assyrians, ruthless, evil. You're talking about, if, you, you, if you've studied World War II history with the Nazis, you're talking about 20 times worse than what the Nazis did to the Jews. These were the Assyrians. And they're coming to Jerusalem. And what does the king, out of all the leaders, the king do? He turns to Isaiah, the representative of God. And he tells Isaiah, Isaiah, what are we going to do? And I imagine Isaiah turned around and said, all we can do is pray. All we can do is cry out to God and ask him to help us. And I imagine that in that prayer, they asked God to forgive them. Lord, forgive us for what we did. All your children are gathered. But listen to what happens. At that night, the angel of the Lord. Uh-oh, here it goes. Here it goes. He went out and struck down. In other words, he killed 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. They looked down and said, what? in the world just happened. I'm going to read it one more time. They cry out to God. They're gathered already. And then it says, the night the angel of the Lord went and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people rose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, listen to what he did. He departed and went home and lived at Nineveh. But guess what happened when the king of Assyria went home? As he entered into the palace or the temple of his pagan god, his two sons saw that he failed and they stabbed him to death. And he died. And Israel wakes up in the morning and they look out and God has delivered his promise. Not only did he gather all his children, but he also helped them against the impossible because we serve a God of the possible. We serve a God that can do anything. And what did they do? What was the answer? Was when all the 12 children of Jacob cried out to heaven, God, help us. Do we serve the same God today? Huh? When we're in times of trouble, what do we have to do? Turn to God. Cry out to God. Pour out your heart to God. 
He'll answer you. He's done it for me. He can do it for you. He did it for Israel. Can you imagine 185,000 Assyrian soldiers dead by the hand of the angel of the Lord? He came and he took care of business. Isn't that amazing that God would gather them? What does the Bible say? Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. In other words, they would have been totally destroyed. The history of Israel, we would not be talking about Israel today. We would not be talking about uh, the, uh, the Messiah coming. All of this had to be fulfilled so that the promised Messiah, Jesus, would then appear in the scene and say, here I am. Because God protected his people. And listen to what they say, except the Lord of hosts. So now that we have the wall of Hezekiah and we have all this, then we can understand that this thing here, this miracle really did take place. Because archaeology proves it to us today. Why? First, because the wall is still there. And second, because the people of Israel are still there. They're still there. If we read Isaiah 37 and 32, For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. Were they a band of survivors? Oh, yeah. They survived. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do what? He will do this. And what is Jesus saying today? Call unto me. And I will answer thee. Let's, let's rise. Let's thank the Lord for, for this. Amen. Thank God for, for what we have today, uh, for, for the remnant that was saved because you and I are here today, because the word of God came through that. And if God would have not worked out this miracle, we wouldn't be here today. So let's, let's bow our heads and let's thank